Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 99, I chat with Jason Hartlove of Nanosys Inc. about his new quantum TV technology. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded February 13th, 2012, episode 99 Quantum TV. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, hassle, and money. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of hometheater.com. This week's guest geek is Jason Hartlove, the CEO of Nanosys, with a new addition to LCD display technology. Hey, Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Those of you who are tuned into the live video stream at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Jason as we go, and uh, I'll pass along as many as I can. So, Jason, I first became aware of your technology at the Cedia show last September, and uh, it intrigued me greatly. Uh, for one thing, the name of your company, Nanosys, which implies nanotechnology, which is always cool, and uh, the name of your technology, which uh, has to do with quantum dots. So um, why don't you give us a, a brief overview of uh, what the heck it is we're talking about here? Sure. So Nanosys is a material science company. We make a unique phosphor material, and it is a nanomaterial. The size of the individual phosphor particles, which we manufacture, range from less than one nanometer to somewhere in the range of two to three nanometers in diameter. So this is very, very small. Uh, typical diameter of a human hair, for example, uh, is, is on the order of 100 microns. Um, two nanometers Which, then would be 10,000 times or uh, five, uh, five to 10,000 times smaller than a human hair in terms of overall diameter. Um, the crystals are a unique material made from the same semiconductor that we get our LEDs from. So, for example, uh, semiconductors, uh, LED systems might be indium phosphide. We make an indium phosphide quantum dot. The difference is in how our crystals emit. In the case of an LED, you drive electrical current in and forward bias the uh, voltage across the, the diode that's formed uh, from these two materials. In our case, we stimulate the phosphor with a photon. So we shine a blue light, for example, or a UV colored light onto our crystal, and our crystal will emit a color. The color of emission is basically defined by the overall crystal diameter that we manufacture. So when we make the crystals at a very small diameter, they will emit in the green and a little bit larger, they become orange and a little bit larger still, they become red. Uh, so I have, actually, I have, I have a demonstration of that right here. Great. I'm going to show you. Uh, this, this was I got at, C at uh, Cedia, rather. It's four vials of, of liquid in which are suspended, I assume, the nanoparticles you're talking about. And here I have a little blue LED. And so I can turn this blue LED on. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but all of a sudden this vial glows. Hang on a second. Oh, maybe the battery ran out. I didn't check this beforehand. You can see it. There it is. It's glowing green. Then this one. Oh, the battery is kind of wearing out, I think. I'm so sorry that that's the case. You might have one sitting there in your office. I do. <laughs> so uh, here we go. I, okay, good. Show, show us. Put it up right next to the camera. Right up close. Okay. I'm not sure how well this camera focuses at that distance, but here's there the green. Oh, boom. There's the green. Uh, there's a nice yellow for you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a nice orange and a nice red. And the thing that's unique about this, 
is that all of these, uh, the, the base material that we're using here is the same. It's an indium phosphide material, but the difference is the size of the nanocrystals varies from uh, right around one nanometer in diameter in the case of the green up to a few nanometers in diameter for the case of the red. And by controlling this uh, uniquely with our uh, manufacturing process, we're able to create these unique colors coming from the same material. That's really critical for display applications because what you're really interested in are very narrow, very specific colors defining your primaries, such as red, green, and blue in an RGB color system. And if you have very broad or well-distributed uh, uh, primary colors, in other words, colors that are not very accurately at the primary points that you want, you're not going to be able to render all of the colors in between as accurately as you can, as, as the math basically defines uh, the system based on very accurate primaries um, in the corners. Mm-hmm. Zeland in the chat room asks, how many of these quantum dots form a single pixel or, or really sub-pixel? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, we're talking about uh, on the order of 10 to the 12th nanocrystals per uh, square centimeter. Um, so, you know, depending on the size of your pixel, you can divide backwards from there and, and uh, calculate how many there are per pixel. Mm -hmm. uh, JC in the chat room is is saying, wow, sorting the particles by size must be a serious challenge, which leads <laughs> to the question, you know, how do you, how do you do that? How do you control the size of these particles? Yeah, we actually don't sort them. We grow them in individual batches uh, to the specific size requirement our customer might have. So, for example, if a customer has a requirement that the red emission wavelength be defined as let's just arbitrarily say 630 nanometers, then we would grow the crystals during our synthesis process for that customer uh, to that size. And then those would be the red crystals that would be used in making the product. If uh, another so customer all the crystals wanted, coming out of that process would be of that size. Correct, correct. And then for a different customer, maybe a different customer wants to define red as 627 nanometers, we do a different growth synthesis for him and make those at 627, and those would be two separate batches that were grown uniquely and independently to meet their requirements. Sorting them is not really possible. Right. I wouldn't think so. As somebody <laughs> in the chat room said, yeah, just really tiny little sieves. Yeah, really <laughs> tiny. Sieves. Really <laughs> tiny. <laughs> well, now the uh, so so you you grow these different nanocrystals. Uh, one of the questions that I had, they're called quantum dots, and I actually have a degree in physics, so I have enough knowledge to be dangerous, shall we say? Um, what is quantum about them? I mean, quantum physics, we we hear all about you know probabilistic uh, orientations, and uh, things can be in two places at once, and so on and so forth, all sorts of quantum weirdness. What sorts of quantum weirdness uh, come up with, uh, with these nanocrystals or quantum dots? Well, the way in which these uh, particles work is using what's known as a quantum confinement. And quantum confinement refers to effectively what we would call the Bohr radius of excitation. And so when a, a photon comes in and strikes one of these crystals, and these crystals now, you've got to remember, are just comprised of, you know, hundreds of atoms. It's a very, very small number of actual atoms of the materials that we're using per Molecules, crystal. Molecules, really, because it's indium arsenide, did you say? Indium phosphide, uh, phosphide for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, uh, we the, the photonic energy comes into this crystal, and obviously it's going to create some excitation. That excitation energy is bound to remain within the diameter or radius of the nanocrystal that we've got. Mm. And so the maximum energy that that exciton can actually get to depends upon how much crystal material we have. It's not as though 
the exciton can travel for an infinite distance or a practical, practically speaking, an infinite distance away from where it starts. It can only travel to the edge of the crystal. And because the crystal is so small, um, that basically limitation on the exciton's uh, energy uh, effectively becomes the defining quantum confinement around that exciton. And then when that exciton drops back down, we have a photonic emission that corresponds in terms of energy to that uh, that overall crystal radius. So this is... And the crystal radius quantum- is defined by the size of the quantum dots. That's right. So we grow them to a particular size during our synthesis process. That means that when they're excited, they're only going to emit at that wavelength that corresponds to the size that we grew them to. Uh, it's a very unique material. Um, most of your other phosphor materials that you have out there in industry today uh, behave very differently from this. They're more of an oscillator type phosphor or scintillator. Um, the uh, quantum confinement nature of these phosphors means that they can be made with very precise peak wavelengths, um, which again is something that the display industry can really benefit from in terms of improving the color fidelity, uh, especially in uh, LED backlighting. Right. Now, uh, before we get to to how it's used in an LED TV, which I definitely want to get to, uh, the question that occurred to me was, you, you say that uh, that the wavelength of the emission is very well-defined and very narrow. Is it as narrow as a laser? It's, uh, it's not as narrow as a laser. Um, we have built in, if we look at the uh, uh, quantum mechanics, again, back to that word quantum, if we look at the quantum mechanics, the uh, full width half maximum or the distribution function uh, for a given quantum dot is going to be about uh, 15 nanometers uh, spectral width. Um, our synthesis process uh, is accurate to within about twice that. So what we do on a high volume mass production basis is offer a full width half max of around 30 nanometers. And 30 nanometers is really quite good for display applications, but it's not as narrow as a laser. It's not a single wavelength. Right, exactly. Um, but it's pretty narrow, a lot narrower than, than uh, your typical LCD flat panel. Yes, these are more like 100 to 120 nanometer uh, broad, very broad spectrum in the yellow. And from that, you have to select out the components of green and red. And this is what leads you to have a very diffuse color uh, definition of what exactly is green and red in your traditional LCD panel. So rather than having just a single primary or a dominant primary with a little bit of distribution around it, you have a very broad primary color. Right. Now, we actually have a couple of uh, uh, QuickTime movies that you sent me to illustrate this. Uh, They're called Standard. Let's take a look first at the Standard Light Spectrum movie, uh, which uh, I know that John, our engineer, has. Here it is. And uh, tell us about this. Right. So this is what is typically used, a so-called white LED Um, The white LED spectra comes from that uh, blue source material. That's a gallium nitride LED. It's a very efficient LED. It's the most efficient of all the LED uh, source materials that are out there um, in terms of energy conversion. Pardon me me for interrupting, but maybe John can run that again. I think it does kind of cut off pretty quick and then maybe pause it at that point there. So the blue is coming from the LED itself, and then the phosphor is creating this very broad kind of yellow peak. That broad yellow peak has components of green, yellow, orange, red, and many other colors in it. Now, what the display must do is it must separate in order to to get good color performance. It's got to separate red, green, and blue from this spectra. And now you, wait, before, before you go on, you said, you said that the LED was emitting blue... And then the phosphor was emitting this broad spectrum of, of green and yellow and red. I didn't know that LEDs, um, uh, LED, uh, LCD TVs, LED illuminated TVs had phosphors in them. Yes. So all white LEDs that you get today, I shouldn't say all, but the dominant uh, white LEDs that you get today 
are using a white phosphor um, to create ah. a white LED from component level red, green, and blue LEDs is neither uh, cost effective nor energy efficient. This is because while people may be familiar with red LEDs or green LEDs, their power efficiency is actually really quite poor. And especially when you look at the energy star standards and things like this, it's impossible to meet those using red, green, and blue LEDs. However, the blue LED is, is the most efficient of the three and is far more efficient, more than 10 times as efficient as the green, for example. So in order to generate white, rather than trying to make a red, green, blue mix from primary LED colors, what the LED industry does is it uses the blue and uses a white phosphor material. The most commonly used one is something called YAG, which is a yttria alumina garnet material. Hmm. Or yttrium is a, a rare earth material. And this phosphor basically receives those blue photons, uh, is stimulated, uh, excited by the, uh, by the phot uh, photonic uh, incident photon from the blue. And just, then we'll just like, emit. Just like in a plasma TV, which, is, which has phosphors that yes. are stimulated by ultraviolet photons. Exactly. Exactly the same. Only in, in this particular case, um, the goal, uh, the phosphors here are trying to emit very broad uh, color so you can get white. Now, the, uh, the YAG material efficiency is very good. So the combination of this blue source with this yellow phosphor gives you a quite efficient LED uh, light source. Um, however, the problem, again, is that it doesn't give you very well-defined green and red color characteristics. Right. And so when you go to make a, a display from this type of LED light source, you wind up with very muddy color, especially in the reds and the greens. Um, our technology... First, before, we, before we move on to your technology, I do want to uh, show another movie uh, called LE, LCD Anatomy with Pixels just to show that once you get this essentially white light, this blue spike with a wide spectrum across... Um, uh, yellow, green, and red. Uh, then you you still you need to have uh, color filters, RGB color filters, uh, to then create the red, green, and blue primaries. And uh, I, I just before we left that subject, I wanted to uh, see if we could call up the uh, LCD Anatomy with Pixels movie. Here it is. Um, and as we move through this, we'll see. That the there's the LCD panel, there's a backlight at the back, and as the movie progresses, we will see uh, the the actual color filters and how they are distributed um, on the LCD panel. That's right, and so by uh, time division multiplexing within a frame, you can change the amount of red, green, and blue light that's uh, seen at any individual pixel location. Um, by doing this, and the human eye response is much slower, the human eye will integrate these uh, red, green, and blue pixels into a particular color. Uh, for example, if you only illuminated the green pixel and turned off the red and the blue for the entire period during one frame, then that pixel would appear to be green. If you illuminated the red and the green for equal amounts of time and didn't illuminate the blue, then that pixel would appear to be yellow. And so by doing this, you can create individual different colors at the pixel locations. But the quality of the color that you create there is only as good as the quality of the, co the primary color, that is to say the quality of the red, green, or blue that you have to work with. So if your red is actually kind of orange, then when you go to combine orange together with green, you don't get an exact yellow. You get something that's sort of yellowish, but may tend a little bit more towards the green side of yellow, more like a chartreuse than a true yellow. And mm -hmm. so this is where you get into this issue around the quality of your primaries being very important. You can and, here we, and here we have a, uh, a movie called QDEF Light Spectrum, 
We just saw the standard light spectrum. Now we're going to take a look at the QDEF, QDEF, which is um, your the name of your technology, uh, quantum dot enhancement film. We'll talk about that in a minute. But here we see the the spectrum of the QDEF um, film. That's right. And so in our particular case, we are basically uh, creating a true red, green, blue backlight uh, source. And so now when the color filters want to, uh, when you want to have a green color, uh, all the green color filter has to do is basically have uh, a very narrow, very wide acceptance. It has to eliminate the blue and the red color from showing when the green pixels open. But the, gr the quality of the green color is really defined by the green in the backlight unit itself rather than defined by uh, how well you can extract green from this big muddy mess of white. And hmm. so, in other words, you can wind up with a, a green pixel response, which is very narrow, and that means you wind up with much better defined green primary, red primary, blue primary, and this allows you to increase color gamut and color fidelity quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Shine LED in the chat room, I think is the name, says uh, that a major criticism of quantum dots uh, has tr traditionally been around longevity and thermal stability. Uh, he, he, he or she, I don't know who at which, says uh, they can be pretty sensitive to this. How has Nanosys dealt with this? Yeah, so we've spent um, the best part of the last three years working specifically on this issue. Uh, we have uh, really perfected a technique for putting the quantum dots into a uh, a matrix material, uh, which is what we call a, a film, basically. The film is in the backlight stack rather than directly on the LED uh, surface itself. And so in this way, we've managed the thermal issue by removing the phosphor material from direct contact with the really hot parts of what are in the display. Um, in addition to the thermal stability issue, which we've addressed by this architecture, uh, we've stabilized these materials in this film format so that they can meet the requirements of uh, today's displays, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 hour lifetimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this way, uh, uh, we think that the material is quite usable now for the display industry. Now. If I'm correct, if I'm understanding what we're talking about here correctly, really what you're talking about is a new backlight for LCD TVs. Instead of the traditional white LEDs, you're, you're talking about putting a QDEF film and as the backlight. Am I, have I got that right? We're going to use a QDEF film that is optically pumped using blue LEDs. So... Effectively, what we do is we remove, we use the same, we have our customers actually use the same blue LEDs that they use today, only no phosphor in the package. So the... So uh, no white phosphor, it's just no coming white out. No white phosphor, that's right. So now they, you just have blue being pumped into the light guide plate, which is the back panel which uh, is and the... And as you're talking about this, we do have a, uh, a movie to demonstrate this too, which is called Where QDEF Fits in an LCD. So as we yeah. pull that up, here we go. Exactly. So now we've got the, uh, the same sort of uh, uh, stack photo we showed earlier. Um, the traditional architecture is to have a white backlight with a diffuser, some kind of brightness enhancing film, and then the LCD panel in front which we showed earlier with those uh, uh, red, green, and blue color pixels. What we right. do is we replace that diffuser with a sheet of material we call QDEF, and we change from a white backlight um, to a blue backlight. And so now by pumping with the blue backlight onto this QDEF sheet, we create that unique red, green, blue color spectra. Uh, all of the rest of the architecture of the display remains the same. Um, blue LEDs are actually more uniformly or more universally able to be sourced by our customers. So they actually wind up being cheaper as well. 
And so this uh, is, a, is a nice architectural feature that they get from using our technology. Now, uh, several people in the chat room have mentioned OLED. And mm-hmm. I, want to, I want to bring this up because we saw it at CES. I'm sure you did too. Of course. Um, Samsung and uh, LG had OLED TVs at 55 inches. Uh, Sony had its crystal LED TV, which I thought at first was just their name for OLED, but it seems like they've actually perhaps um, managed to create microscopic actual LEDs, red, green, and blue LEDs, and, and use those. Um, do you know anything about that, first of all? But second of all, how do you compare your technology to OLED? Right. So our technology, uh, we feel in terms of color performance, brightness, and uh, lifetime is superior to OLEDs. And this is something that our customers are showing as well. Uh, The OLED still has some of the same limitations as a traditional uh, phosphor-based approaches uh, have gone in that the peak wavelengths that you can actually get with the OLED molecules are not exactly where you might want them to be in order to get your good color performance and fidelity. Hmm. Now, different OLED manufacturers have addressed this in different ways. For example, some of the OLED set makers uh, provide what they call a color by white which basically means that they are, again, making a same kind of a white backlight system and then using those red, green, and blue color filters to selectively pull out the red, green, and blue components. The big problem we, we, here... We know pretty sure that LG does that. You, you may not be able to say that, but I will. <laughs> very good. So based on what you said, uh, that set, for example, does not have uh, uh, the same level of power efficiency as a blue backlit or white backlit LED-based television would have. Uh, OLED efficiency, in terms of white OLED efficiency, is quite a bit lower than what you get out of crystalline LEDs. Um, And, you know, the the two industries are at different maturation points in terms of evolving the technology, and this is expected to be, to continue to be, uh, part of the the gap between OLED and crystalline LED technology for quite some time to come. But crystalline LEDs, um, the traditional type used in LED light fixtures and LED backlights, have heretofore suffered from not having a good phosphor material that could really help create those unique red-green peaks. So mm-hmm. that's what our technology does, as we discussed earlier, and that's very, very different in terms of the efficiency, in terms of the brightness that you can get, and in terms of the actual ability to design the peak wavelengths, if you're a set maker, for example, uh, to match up to your color filter technology so that you get the optimal color response from the set. Um, Again, with the OLED material, you do have some limitations in terms of what emission wavelengths you can actually get out of the materials. Um, and with our quantum dots, uh, hopefully we explained well earlier, they are a continuously tunable uh, material, so we can get any wavelength of emission. Uh, of course, they're not continuously tunable on a, uh, they're only continuously tunable at the time of our manufacture, but we right. can do <laughs> that specifically for a given application. Um, whereas an OLED uh, red may be defined as a 615 nanometer, which is actually sort of a reddish orange, uh, we can push that red as deep as people really want it to get. Whereas an OLED manufacturer cannot, is that what you're saying? That's correct. That's correct. They're limited to the molecules that they've been able to design thus far, and their uh, their scaling of those to adjacencies and adjacent wavelengths is not uh, is not good and not nearly at the level that we have with our uh, quantum dot material. Mm-hmm. What about the Sony Crystal LED? Do you know anything about that? Is it true? Do you know? Uh, I know you can't. You're not speaking for Sony, and we're not expecting you to. But um, they, uh, what I've read lately, seems to indicate that they're actually using microscopic crystalline LEDs. 
Yeah, so I worked for a number of years at uh, Hewlett Packard and uh, what then became Agilent Technologies. And part of that is, of course, now Philips LumiLeds. Um, so I was always in that semiconductor components part of the business. Mm-hmm. And we had this type of LED based uh, display. Um, uh, for a long time, we uh, uh, had them very, very small. Um, they were called seven segment displays, for example, and they basically had seven individual LEDs forming the kind of numeral, if you would, right? It's basically the the outline of the figure eight, and then depending mm-hmm. upon what number you wanted to illuminate, you just turn on, you know, the one at the top and the two down the right side to sure, sure, left, seven, seven segment, seven segment exactly. uh, numerics, exactly. yeah, exactly. So. From what I understand, this is basically what Sony has done now is they've they've essentially made this type of of techno taken this type of technology, miniaturized it, and done each uh, individual location as a as a cluster of red, green, and blue. Exactly what that clustering is and what the size domains are of those individual LEDs, et cetera. You know, I, I have not read anything that indicates uh, what those are. Obviously, they were quite small. Um, to be able to uh, to have this sort of uh, high performance and high resolution that they showed, right? Exactly. But it's almost a, it seems like taking the diamond vision concept almost uh, from an outdoor stadium and yes. bringing it down to uh, to the uh, high definition uh, living room sort of size form factor. Right. That's that's kind of the way I looked at it as well. Uh, a couple of people in the chat room are wondering about. Um, the efficiency in lumens per watt and the color rendering index of uh, yeah. QDEF. Right. So uh, color rendering index is really something that applies to uh, illumination-based uh, uh, standards. So when we talk about uh, CRI, uh, usually you're talking about light bulbs and how well objects illuminated by light sources um, are accurately rendered, how well the colors are accurately rendered. In uh, the display space, which is really where we focus so far, uh, it, we talk more about the accuracy or performance to the standard color gamuts. And these are things like NTSC, DCI P3, um, S- Rec 709, Rec 709, sRGB, et cetera. And so as far as our performance against all of those standards, we outperform or we can create a color envelope, which is basically beyond those standards. And what this really means is that a set maker has now the ability uh, with the rest of his color processing between the color filters and the uh, color processing that he uses to actually fully meet those standards and fully accurately render those colors as they were captured or intended or encoded for the particular broadcast uh, or distribution media that he might be looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, The uh, efficiency uh, overall in terms of uh, our efficiency versus a benchmark, uh, we can look at, for example, the color gamut. So for a... um, uh, Adobe RGB based monitor, which is something that you can go out if you're a professional uh, in the media industry in particular, you probably have already gone out and purchased one of these. People buy these when they're in the graphics, uh, graphic illustration business, advertising business, etc., because the colors on the, on the display exactly accurately match the standard defined colors and the print that comes out of the printer and the print that comes out of the magazine, et cetera. So this end-to-end color fidelity in the process is very important for people in that industry. So if we look at the way they make those sets today, they do use a red, green, blue LED-based backlight system. And as I said earlier, because of the power inefficiencies, uh, these sets really are not able to give you what you need for a consumer type of product. Um, Our products are more than two times as efficient as those, more than 50% as efficient in terms of performance to color standards as your white LED is today. So overall, there's a huge efficiency gain. This is in part due to the fact that the internal quantum efficiency of our phosphors is very, very high. 
uh, over 92% for everything that we put into uh, uh, products that are uh, shipped out for, uh, for our customers' applications. But also because we are managing the light directly into the spaces where our customers want it to be. So we don't have any yellow light energy in our spectra. We don't create that energy in the television uh, set or the, the RGB-based display monitor, the yellow light energy is completely wasted. It, if the color filters are fully effective, they completely cut out all of that yellow light energy, and they only extract from that white backlight the red and the green, and they don't extract any of the yellow. So mm. essentially, you're creating a whole bunch of light with a white LED backlight source or even a white OLED backlight source, which is outside the band of useful energies. And so, so you you're, just want so the efficiency is low. Light. That's correct. Your, your overall throughput efficiency is low. People mm-hmm. talk a lot about the efficiency of each individual component in these sets. For example, people talk about uh, the efficiency of the backlight or they talk about the efficiency of the uh, display panel to actually transmit light through. But when you add all of these things together, this is really the thing that matters because it's about how bright is the display versus how many electrons or how much how much wattage you put into it. And so by putting the light in the right places with high efficiency, uh, then we are able to get both very high efficiency conversion of the wattage into those color channels, and we're able to get very good uh, throughput of the, of the backlight light all the way through to the end user's eyeball. Mm, mm. Uh, <clears throat> Shine LED in the chat room uh, is responding to what you were talking about earlier in terms of uh, pushing the red wavelength longer to essentially whatever you want. And uh, the Shine LED says, but pushing the red wavelength will vastly reduce the effective light level. Do you agree? Yeah. So the, the choice of uh, peak wavelengths, this is why the efficiency question is always a little bit of a hard one to answer. Mm-hmm. The choice of the peak, peak wavelengths really does affect the uh, overall brightness. Um, generally speaking, about one nanometer shift uh, away from the peak results in something like a 1% decrease in overall brightness. And this, is, this has nothing to do with our material. This is the eye response. Mm. And so as a, as a rule of thumb, that generally holds to be true. So if you were to call your peak green wavelength, let's say 535 nanometers, and um, if you measured the efficiency at 535, and then you move the, the peak green wavelength, let's say you ask Nanosys to make you a phosphor that was 528 nanometers, then the overall brightness of the display using the 528 would be, using an optical me- instrument, would be lower than what you would measure with the 535. However, and this is the key point, um, there is very much a, uh, an effect called the HK effect or Helmholtz Kohlrusch effect. It's well known and well studied in color theory and science around the perceived brightness of accurate and saturated primary colors. And so oftentimes people look at the sets that we demonstrate and they can clearly see that the sets with a better color are brighter. And they say, oh, that one's much brighter. Did you do something to it to make it brighter? When in fact, if we put an instrument up to those sets, you would find that the instrument reading actually shows the set to not be as bright in terms of um, nits, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is also a phenomena that we see in the OLED space as well. Typically, OLEDs nowadays are coming out with a brightness which is two to two and a half times lower than what you have out of a comparable LCD. But people Mm. don't see them as so much dimmer. Um, they do see the uh, saturated colors as basically their brain, your brain processes these in, in a much different way than these sort of muddy and washed out low contrast colors. And you get a perception of brightness that, according to instruments, isn't really there. So hmm. overall, this is something that manufacturers have to come to terms with. Samsung is, um, 
uh, proposed uh, as part of the working group uh, within the uh, SID, the Society for Information Display, some new standards around perceptual color, uh, perceptual brightness and perceptual color fidelity and things like this, uh, which have a lot more to do with the way we understand how we interact with color and color science than just the mathematics behind it, which has been a large part of what some of our standards are defined as today. Mm-hmm. Floop in the chat room asks a related question. Does better color fidelity increase apparent resolution? Is 4K an attempt to solve a problem best solved elsewhere? Yeah, it's a very good question. And so the fact is, if you have better color depth um, available for your 8 bits, for example, then the, the detail is actually improved. And we absolutely can see that in the displays that, that we're working on with our customers. When uh, we show the exact same images, for example, and I, I know it's not going to come through on this webcast, but if you were here in person, you would look at these two displays behind us, and what you would see is that the detail, especially in the shadow of, uh, let me make sure I put my put the correct hand up here because I'm going <laughs> to, the detail in this uh, image here, uh, you would see appears to be much greater, especially in the shadow and the reflection and everything else, than what you have in this one. Yet the two displays are exactly the same in terms of the pixel count, pixel resolution, and everything else. Mm. Um, so we have, uh, we definitely have uh, some, again, perceptual uh, advantage in terms of detail, uh, resolution uh, at the pixel level. It doesn't mean we have more pixels, but right. each pixel will have a better definition between the different shades uh, going from black to white as a result, or going from no color to full color as a result of having this technology. Mm. Well, you mentioned a uh, color gamut earlier, and I want to talk quite a bit about that in the time we have left. But before we do, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. Now, Netflix, of course, uh, is well known to all viewers of Home Theater Geeks. Uh, most of you probably have it already. I sure do. And uh, I have it because it's so easy to use. You can stream thousands of TV shows and movies directly to your TV, your PC or Mac. Uh, you can use just about any device to stream the content from Netflix, including Blu-ray players. Most Blu-ray players have it now. TVs have them directly. Gaming consoles, uh, tablets, even your iPhone or some Android phones. Uh, you can stream from just about any device you have. Uh, and watch anything you want, when you want, the instant you want to watch it. Uh, you can even start on one device and finish on another. So uh, it's the ultimate inconvenience. And, um, boy, there's just no reason not to try it, especially with uh, Twit listeners being given a 30-day free trial. You can go to tw uh, netflix.com slash twit and uh, start your 30-day free trial streaming thousands of TV shows and movies directly to your TV, PC, home entertainment system, or portable entertainment system uh, without, uh, with, while saving money, time, and hassle. Be sure to use that URL, netflix.com slash twit. And we thank twi uh, Netflix for their, uh, for their sponsorship and help uh, supporting uh, the Twit Network. Thank you so much. Okay, so... Um, Jason, you were mentioning color gamut earlier, which is the range of colors that a given TV can display or reproduce. And I believe it would be fair to say, would it not, that uh, QDEF uh, gives you a pretty wide, or the ability to create a very wide color gamut, wider than is normally seen on consumer TVs today. Yeah, so if we just look at that Netflix uh, little logo that you popped up there, um, mm -hmm. I think this is a great example because this is one we see all the time, uh, Netflix and Coca-Cola. So um, if you go home tonight, if you're a Netflix subscriber and you still get discs delivered to your house in the uh, envelopes uh, rather than streaming, you will take a look at that envelope and you'll see that the envelope is red. Their logo is red. 
And the color across the bottom of most of your uh, uh, user screens right now, if you look at that uh, in isolation, if you hold that red envelope up to that, you'll see that the color that they're seeing right now on their screen is actually orange. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not red. And that's because the limitation in the, the color processing system, including the backlight that many of your users are going to have, um, is not that good. And so the uh, ability to actually render that color accurately uh, is not there. And that's what our creation of wider color gamut is really all about. Um, the capture standards are there already. Um, all of the colors that are being captured when someone is filming a, a movie, for example, these are all captured to the full color gamut and the full standards which are out there in the in the uh, industry today, even beyond that, in fact. And then they're edited down to a much smaller subset of color. In fact, a subset that is uh, oftentimes less than what is uh, less than half of what we see when we go outside and look around in nature and we just look outside and see natural colors. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only place where you can really see this interpretation of color that's as the cinematographers often expect, et cetera, is to, is to actually go to the movie theater. The movie, theater do have, the movie theaters do have very expensive, very accurate uh, uh, color projection systems, and they're able to render those colors again as they were captured Mm -hmm. very accurately up there onto the wide screen. But when it comes to your DVD, when it comes into your home, you no longer have that ability to actually display all those colors. And so it's downsampled, it's clipped, it's cropped. There's a whole variety of, of different ways in which color is basically mangled um, down to a lower overall color gamut um, to really fit the display device. And so by what we talk about uh, high color gamut, we're really talking about being able to achieve uh, the full standard color gamuts that are out there in the space today, uh, which heretofore, as you said, are not available for the consumers. Now, we have a couple of examples I wanted to show also of the difference between uh, the standard color gamut that, that we often see on TVs and the expanded color gamut that you're talking about. For example, Coke bottles. Uh, we have a still image of Coke of the Coca-Cola. You were mentioning that earlier, and here it is. Yeah, exactly. And so with the uh, standard display technology, what you're going to have, uh, and again, this, keep in mind, is, is very difficult to actually create an image that, uh, that showcases this. Uh, when you look at this uh, on a display that's been enabled with our uh, quantum dot enhancement film, what you'll see is that all of the detail uh, and the variations so that you can see that sort of uh, half relief Coca-Cola running in the background in large letters, all of that is still there. All of that is still present. But when, you, uh, when we actually put this image now onto this set, uh, and these were, these were shot in very you know, high, uh, high color gamut uh, capture, and they were shown on two different displays. One on the right is a standard uh, tablet, which is showing about 50% um, of the uh, overall NTSC color gamut, for example. And the one on the left, which has been uh, retrofit to use our QDEF technology. So when we look at these displays with our eyes, not through this webcast, what mm -hmm. you're going to see is that the one on the left has a more accurate version of red, which is close to what Coca-Cola logo really looks like if you pick up a bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, and you will also see all of those details, such as the half tones and all the other uh, data. Now, that's not coming through, uh, even on the display as I'm looking at it here on the webcast side as we're broadcasting, as you're broadcasting, because the, the quality of the display that, that we're looking at it on doesn't have that depth. Right. Um, but really we're talking about brighter color, we're talking about more vibrant color, um, being able to uh, render that more accurately to what, what Coca-Cola really expects their brand color to be. We have a, one more example I wanted to show, which was uh, called Green Frog, and it shows the uh, the difference in green. 
Yeah. So again, you know, I, I was lucky and had a chance to go down to Costa Rica um, this past summer. And, you know, the, the frog on the, in this case, the frog on the left, you know, he looks kind of sick, honestly speaking. <laughs> Um, you know, like, like he didn't eat something uh, that really agreed with him very well. And, and when you go again out to the rainforest or you go into uh, a planetarium or something like this, not a planetarium, a, a, a botanical gardens, and you see these right. creatures, um, mm-hmm. you, you see the, the much deeper colors of green um, than what you would see in the standard display, which is the one that's shown on the left and the one on the right. This is a retrofit a uh, 47 inch using our backlight technology. Mm-hmm. Now, a uh, number of people in the chat room are asking the same question that I had on my mind uh, when talking about an expanded color gamut, which is you, you mentioned, and rightly so, that the movies are captured with a wider color gamut and then that color gamut has to be um, decreased in order to put on a Blu-ray or a DVD and then shown on a on a TV, a current TV, hopefully, that can reproduce that same color gamut. So the question becomes, if the TV can reproduce a wider color gamut, yes, it may be more accurate to the director's original intent, but it's not accurate to the Blu-ray, which is admittedly limited to Rec. 709, which is what's typically used, and HDTV broadcasts as well. Um, how do you um, justify uh, making what's on the disc or being broadcast inaccurately reproduced? <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a good question. There are a number of uh, great companies out there that do this kind of color space conversion technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, Technicolor, EE Color, um, uh, there, are, there are many others that basically can remap color space. Um, I do not proclaim to be an expert in how to do that and uh, get back to the original fidelity, Um, but they have some amazing algorithms behind it. We work closely with them on taking this kind of Rec. 709 or low fidelity color uh, and mapping it to a, a wider color space. Uh, another key thing that we also do working with our customers is we actually make sure that when they have a Rec. 709 content coming into the display is rendered like Rec. 709. And so because we have an increased gamut does not mean that we have to push out to the increased gamut for all scenes. Well, this is what um, we a- certainly do in terms of uh, TV reviews. Uh, we sometimes get TVs in that, um, uh, you know, have a wider color gamut. And we always try to see if we can rein that in to Rec. 709. Right. And so this is something that's really dependent upon the set manufacturer to do a good job with. The, color uh, the management technologies to really both bad. upscale and downscale color and do that on the fly color conversion are quite mm-hmm. practical and quite cost effective nowadays. Um, however, it's really incumbent on the set manufacturer to make sure that he builds that capability in and he's just not letting the colors run wild. Um, we're providing the set manufacturers the ability to make a set now, which when new content comes, when you have Adobe RGB content, when you have lots of other versions of content that are out there that are beyond Rec. 709, when those are available to be displayed for you. And believe me, I think they will be coming very quickly because color is becoming an issue that people are talking about. When OLED comes, you have the same issue. Yes. OLED is far beyond the color gamut of what you have in your traditional backlit LCD televisions. That's so, right. And I've, and I've it, said, by, by the way, when, when we saw them at uh, CES, my, one of my first thoughts was, it better damn well have a color management system that lets me rein those colors into Rec. 709. Right. And so I think those factors, those uh, questions have to be answered when we start to see movement towards OLED and whether or not that's in the form of expanded color gamut content being available for uh, the user audience, which I'm sure, by the way, that... uh, you know, Lucasfilm is going to be very happy to sell you 
uh, the Star Wars complete set again for the eleventh time <laughs> with an expanded color gamut version, right? So there, there will be expanded color gamut content available for these. This was my next question. <laughs> yes, that's my next question. Do you expect the color gamut of commercially distributed content to be expanded in the future as more TVs, perhaps uh, OLEDs, QDEFs, whatever, uh, you know, have the ability? to reproduce them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this, uh, this is a great repurposing opportunity for all the content owners and providers uh, to basically remarket things that they've already got in the can. And, and uh, uh, that's part of how uh, these businesses uh, uh, can, can maintain very good profitability and invest back in new projects. The uh, other things that we see happening are the the sort of upscaling technology that you mentioned earlier, the downscaling uh, and color mapping on the fly uh, Mm -hmm. becoming part of the set architectures. Um, And, you know, this would very much be like, for example, if you took a a, a DVD um, and you want to play it in HD, uh, those on the fly uh, conversions are available today for resolution. Um, those on-the-fly uh, conversions will be available for color as well. Mm-hmm. Companies like EE Color and Runco, in fact, are promoting expanded color gamuts, uh, intelligent color processing, I should say, that expands the color gamut, uh, which uh, I'm sure you support as well. Yes, absolutely. We think these companies uh, have great algorithms. We've been working with them. Um, what we're doing really is we're producing a high quality uh, backlight. Um, the actual uh, quality of what you see on the set depends on many other factors besides sure. the backlight. But of if course. the backlight is junk, you're not going to be able to do better than that. So right. we're, we're moving now to a point where the, the primaries that we are able to help the set makers define are very, very good. Um, but there's a lot of additional opportunities and uh, good technologies out there for the additional color processing, um, for, as we said, repurposing of content uh, with new, higher uh, quality, uh, either broadcast or distribution uh, standards, et cetera. Mm-hmm. By the way, a couple people in the chat room have wondered whether my shirt is red or orange. And I can tell you it's orange. <laughs> it is not <laughs> It is not red. <laughs> How about your lava lamp? I was wondering about that one myself. Yeah, the lava lamp is orange, too. Definitely. Yeah, okay, there you go. All right. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Floop in the chat room asks, uh, are there any, can you tell us about any displays that are going to be available to consumers that use this technology? Uh, we have uh, several big customers that are going to be introducing displays this year. I'm uh, unfortunately not allowed to... Uh, pre-announce their products for them. So um, all I can tell you is uh, we've been working on this with all the major display manufacturers and consumer electronic product manufacturers for over three years now. And and, uh, you'll see commercial devices this year. I'm I'm surprised we didn't, or did I simply miss them at CES? They were, there were some there, but they were not on the the, uh, public show floor. Hmm. They were hidden in secret rooms, and I was not invited. Or whatever, yeah, those types of situations. I got it. I wish I had known. Well, maybe by uh, Cedia, huh? There was one that was almost on the floor. So, yeah, we hope that uh, that at some of the coming shows this year we'll we'll see some of those out there. But, again, I'm I'm not in control of that myself. So, yeah, understood. Uh, Before we go, um, somebody in the chat room, I'm looking for it now. I can't find it. Uh, asked me to ask you about your lithium-ion batteries. Do you work on lithium-ion batteries? As I said, we're a material science company, and uh, we make materials for a variety of different applications. Uh, uh, Another one that we work in is uh, high-energy capacity materials for lithium-ion batteries. Um, This allows uh, battery cell manufacturers, who are our customers for those products, to actually get higher energy density in the same form factor. Mm. So what this means is, you know, for example, your your tablet computers, your smartphones today uh, are really largely limited by the size of the battery. 
Um, the display electronics and all the other electronics that you have in, in something like an iPhone is really on the order of about a millimeter thick, but the overall phone is, uh, you know, four to five millimeters thick. And this is really driven by the uh, volume that's occupied by the battery. By increasing the uh, density of energy storage in lithium ion batteries, what we're able to do is help manufacturers maintain their same battery life and shrink that form factor of the battery, uh, which is really key for a lot of these consumer electronic applications, or alternately to be able to maintain their form factor and increase the battery life or runtime. Um, those are the uh, variables or degrees of freedom they get by using our material to manufacture the battery cells. Mm -hmm. One final question, Caffeine Free Dave in the chat room asks, uh, what do we look for when it comes out? Will, will, will manufacturers tout this? Will they say now with QDEF? Or, I sure or hope so. Some way? <laughs> I do believe that there, you know, this industry does like to do uh, branding. Um, you know, uh, although it was a complete misnomer, you will recall the LED TV when it came out. Oh, oh. Uh, Man, so, I hated that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, again, uh, that's that's far beyond. Uh, we're we're a B two B supplier of material technology to to the display makers, so I'm not sure how they'll brand it. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see QD TV or something like that out there. Sure, sure. Well, I I hope so, and I look forward to uh, seeing them in the market, and in particular, getting one into my studio for review. <laughs> Outstanding. I'll make sure that happens for you. Great. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jason Hartlove, uh, the CEO of Nanosys. You can find his uh, company uh, online at nanosysinc.com. And uh, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. That's It's great. Very geeky. <laughs> Uh, of course, my online homes are my online home is uh, hometheater.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv with suggestions for guests or questions. I answer on hometheater.com uh, several questions a week. So send them, all, send them along to me and I'll uh, see if I can get to them. Um, and I, you can follow me on Twitter, of course, at htgeekscott. Next week, uh, Twit is taking President's Day off, so we will be dark then. But the following week is a very special episode of Home Theater Geeks. It is my 100th episode, and I am pleased and proud to announce that my special guest for that episode will be none other than uh, Alan Parsons, legendary engineer, producer, and musician, who Leo and I talked to briefly at CES for about 15 minutes or so. But on this show, we get him for a whole hour. So we'll be having lots of fun with uh, talking with Alan, and uh, sure hope you will join me for my special 100th episode. Until then, geek out.